Welcome to Community Responses to Cannabis Legalization. State legalization does not necessarily result in uniform community environments that regulate recreational cannabis markets. Local ordinances can be very different. And also they vary among communities and coalitions can play an important part in keeping youth safe in communities. More than half of the US population now live in states where medical or adult use of cannabis is allowed. And as the legal landscape evolves in our own states, prevention practitioners have a role to play in addressing youth cannabis use. We hope to provide you with some insights and ideas as you embark upon your journeys. Next slide. This presentation was prepared for the South Southwest Prevention Technology Transfer Center Network under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. All materials appearing in this publication, except that taken directly from copyrighted sources, is in the public domain. It may be reproduced or copied without permission from the SAMHSA or the authors. The opinions expressed herein are the view of the PTTC network and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health or the Human Health and Human Services Administration or SAMHSA. I will pause briefly for those who would like to read it in its entirety. You'll also be able to download the presentation and view this slide as well because we're recording today. Next, I have the pleasure of introducing your facilitator for today. Cella Rotz, a public health expert and highly skilled trainer, leads programs that improve outcomes for vulnerable populations through the use of evidence-based strategies. She specializes in substance misuse prevention, youth risk prevention, and building resilience. For over 15 years, she's managed award-winning training programs, integrated trauma-informed approaches into prevention, designed successful social marketing campaigns, advised state agencies and community coalitions, and developed cross-sector partnerships to improve services. She is our facilitator today. So please introduce yourself as well in the chat by telling us where you're from, and why you're here today. Without further ado, I give you Gisela Rutz. Well, thanks so much for that warm welcome, Derek. It's um, an honor to be here with you all today. And I see the chat going and seeing lots of people hoping for lots of information today. I will tell you that in an hour and a half, we can't possibly give you that one golden nugget that is going to make the biggest difference in your community. In fact, we could spend days on many of these topics, but we're going to hope to begin to have some of this conversation and um, hopefully give you a few things to be thinking about in your, uh, in your communities. I know some of you just had uh, state uh, ballot questions about cannabis and um, adult use cannabis. So uh, I know this is really relevant for you. Some of some of your states passed that, some of them didn't, and some other of you live in states that have already had adult use personal adult personal use cannabis. Um, others don't. Others have medicinal. So we're all in different places. But I think that one of the things we're really hoping to get at today is that there are some key nuggets that are important for all of us. Um, and just because adult use isn't already present doesn't mean that we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't be thinking about what we can already do. So with that, I uh, want to talk a little bit about our learning objectives. Um, we're going to talk about four risk and protective factors associated with youth cannabis use, um, just four, because again, we could spend a lot more time on a lot of things, but we try to really kind of hone in on four that we think are relevant um, and different at, and, and um, that have some, some key considerations for our prevention work. 
Then we're going to talk a bit about how prevention can inform public health efforts um, and finish up talking about specifically two community based strategies to prevent youth use of cannabis. And I'll just say I saw a lot of a lot of indications that you all already know what at least one of those pr probably both of those are. Um, we're not going to go into a ton of details about them again because we only have limited time, um, but want to give you some key things to be thinking about. Um, some pieces of, of information that are kind of emerging from the research and, and give you a chance to think about kind of, you know, what this might mean for yourselves. And as Derek said, we really do want this to be interactive as much as it can be with so many of us. So we'll have some polls, we'll ask you some questions. Um, and if you have questions, please do put them in the chat. Uh, I have welcomed Derek to interrupt me at any point if we need to clarify a couple of things. Um, <laughs> So thank you all so much. Um, all right, we're going to start with setting the stage. Again, um, as I mentioned, that cannabis landscape has been changing in our country, um, and these changes uh, really have impacts in how we talk about cannabis and how we approach youth prevention. want to set the stage and kind of talk a little bit about the words that I'm using today um, and, and kind of make sure we, you know, we're at least starting from the same starting point from for, for today, at least. Uh, so with that, right? Uh, one of the things that you probably hear already is I'm talking about youth cannabis use, preventing youth cannabis use, adult personal use of cannabis. So I'm using the word cannabis partially because that is the scientific word and that is the word that the PTTC system as a whole has, has opted to use because it is research-based uh, and it is, again, it refers to that, that scientific component. Um, instead of marijuana, which is kind of a little bit more colloquial and also has a few, uh, it comes, comes with cultural implications. So just know that that is intentional. Um, we are, whoop, let me, we are again, we're talking about youth cannabis use. So I'm wondering, um, anything for anyone that comes to mind when we say youth cannabis use, what, what might be something that comes to mind for you? If you want to share that and put it in the chat, we certainly welcome that. We got vaping, contention. Oh, that's going fast. Lots of, I'm seeing lots of vaping. Dabbing. Oh, dab, wax, yep. self-medication, medication. consumption of marijuana products. More vaping. Oh, peer pressure. Brain development. The edibles. Marijuana advertising issues. More vaping. Mental health and edibles. Social media, teenagers, bones. So see a lot. There's a lot in there. <laughs> oh, this is helpful. <laughs> So we could keep going. So this is right, like part of part of what we wanted to do was just uh, acknowledge that we all may think of different things as as these words come to mind. Um, and I think all of you are highlighting kind of why the words that we use are important and why it's also really important to to make sure we um, we kind of center ourselves in, in why we're using those words. Now, we are not going to get into details about um, you know, specifically using for mental health purposes or vaping or those kinds of things today. Um, but there are a few places where, where those topics may intersect and I'll, I'll just try to highlight those. Derek, anything else you want to call out before we move on? Uh, haven't seen anything uh, additional. But, oh, addiction did come up now. Addiction did come up. And, and right? Like, yeah. It's important. It's an important kind of cross-cutting piece, which is a great kind of uh, transition, if you will, to this next slide, um, where we talk about right the fact that adult use laws can have an effect on the use of cannabis by youth. And um, 
you know, one of the things that Nora Volko, who we probably all, we may hopefully we know her name. She's uh, she's one of the leaders at the National Institutes on uh, Drug Addiction, and she, right, like one of the things that she has been researching a lot is that um, the intersection of kind of age of onset or age of first use and uh, further. Uh, development of a use disorder, a cannabis use disorder, or, um, you know, other kind of co-occurring mental health issues, which I, I, I want to just say, like, we're not talking about causation. When you use cannabis as a youth doesn't mean it causes mental health, right? But there appears to be some correlation there. But, but really what Volko tries to say is, right, we want to delay the use as long as we possibly can. And we want to do that because the later use initiates, the less likely someone is to develop a cannabis use disorder. So that's really, really, right? Like that is why we care about preventing youth cannabis use. It's not the only reason, but it's an important part of that story. Um, and we wanna acknowledge that as adult personal use laws come into being that can quote unquote, right, normalize use. And we'll talk about social norms later, but it can change the social norms um, that, that are present in our communities, in our states, in our regions. And I want to highlight here too that, and, and I'll come back to this study later, there was a study that actually found that where um, adult use cannabis, so adult personal use cannabis was legal, the norms around cannabis use tended to be more permissible around alcohol use as well. And this becomes important, right, when we start to think about uh, what is it that we want to prioritize when we're doing prevention? So just just hold that in the back of your head for a few minutes as we kind of dig into some of these details a little bit more. So can I ask a question in the chat for everyone? Sure. I want to ask, um, if y'all could just add in the chat, what are the laws that exist around cannabis in your state at this time? I know there may have been some recent changes, but if you could put it in the chat, because we have people from all over the United States here today, but what are some laws that exist around cannabis in your state? Super helpful. Okay. Oklahoma, Wyoming, still illegal, uh, medical only, very restrictive in Georgia. Kansas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas only medical. Arkansas has medical only. It's it's really important, I think, if you if you don't mind to expand on that. The Arkansas voters just rejected a marijuana legalization ballot initiative just this past Tuesday, Giselle. And the measure would have created a regulated cannabis market for adults 21 and older. It was close to winning, but 55% of the voters voted no. And uh, polling was had generally leaned in the campaign's favor along the way. And it, it, we really thought it was going, it was a, had a strong possibility of passing. Uh, but uh, it's it's interesting that those voters did come out and, and, and were able to, to stop it from becoming a, a law. Well, and just to say, right, this is, this is important because um, the research actually shows that this might actually be a moment in time before adult use becomes legal that uh, that we in prevention want to take action. And so we'll talk about kind of what some of that research says. For those of you who are living in states where adult use is present, right, I'm using, again, adult use, adult personal use as a, as a kind of frame for what a legal uh, retail market might might have. Um, but there's also laws and policies that affect kind of where we where medical or um, retail uh, cannabis adult personal use cannabis can be sold, uh, can be available and the impacts that that has on youth use. I think the one thing that is worth saying here, right, for everybody who said that adult personal use was legal in their state, I think you all pretty much highlighted that it's, you know, 21 plus, which means that, right, it is still unlawful 
for young people to use. And that is the pit, that is the place where where we, you know, there, there's a lot of this, this cannabis discussion that's really complicated that, right, like really kind of brings out sometimes I think the worst in people. But the thing that we tend to agree on, or generally speaking, what we seem to agree on is that we want to delay that that first age of use. We want to prevent youth use. And so um and purchasing cannabis for a lot of youth in a lot of these states where adult use may be, uh, uh, you know, re available by retail, um, that the youth can't buy it. And they can't even get into these stores, right? The the cannabis uh, dispensary that is uh, actually like a three minute walk from from where I live here in Massachusetts. Um, I have to show an ID in order to get in. I you know I can't get in without that. So I think that. Um, that's important. The medicinal is a little bit harder because in some places, and I saw that in the chat, in some places it's, uh, it's allowable for 18 and older. Um, uh, Deanna just commented about North Carolina where CBD is legal, and that is certainly true, but there are CBD uh, derivatives that are approved by the FDA, right? So, so once you get out of once you start talking about CBDs, we're talking about a little bit of a different situation. And I, I just want to highlight that here we're really talking about the cannabis product, whether it's smoked, vaped, or eaten. Um, and I'm not going to get into the de the different details about uh, medicinal uh, kind of laws, but I will talk a little bit about kind of what kinds of things we should be thinking about when medicinal cannabis is present. So um Excellent. There's there's a lot to talk about, so I'll go ahead and and keep us moving if that sounds good, and start with um, just a couple of highlights. This is right. This is related to what I was just saying. So the first is this uh, research study by D'Amico who found that exposure to medicinal ads um, was linked to increased use increased use amongst youth. Um, and for those of us who have worked in underage drinking prevention, this probably sounds familiar, right? Exposure to advertising is one of those things that we think about when we're thinking about um, preventing underage drinking. So we just, uh, I just want to flag that for you all as something to be thinking about. And again, these are medicinal ads that, that has an added connotation of this must be safe because it's medicinal, right? It can help you take care of something. Um, and then we have that, uh, the, the next article by, uh, by Hust um, that talks about proximity to retailers and exposure to advertising is positively associated with the intention to use. So the intention to use is slightly different than, than use, but, but it's, but, but still really relevant in this particular case. Um, right in this particular case, this, these these young people may perceive cannabis to be easier to access, um, and this is our kind of cue to think critically about what's present in our community and how does that have an effect on youth use. Um, Again, if medicinal ads are linked to higher use, what does that mean about where we want to think about limiting medicinal ads? Um, how we might want to think about um, what does this mean for retailers? I'll talk a little bit more about retail and, and density in, in a few minutes, but um, I, I do just want to highlight here, right? We want to be thinking about advertising as its own little piece to this um, that's that's also important. Uh, all right, so we said we are going to talk about four risk and protective factors, and we are. Um, we are going to talk about uh, last actually on the list is is we'll talk about the protective factor one related to parental disapproval. Um, but the risk factors that we're going to talk about are uh, social norms, perception of harm, and availability. And and this, the, the decision to focus on these three is strategic because one of the things that we see, right, is that as social norms change, attitudes become a little bit more permissible. Kind of highlighted this a little bit earlier already. Um, 
and and those then those social norm changes right are often related to those changing laws so in arkansas maybe the social norm hasn't hit that tipping point which is why maybe that law didn't pass last week but once things become right uh, adult use, personal use being available being legal that also uh changes availability in terms of retail availability um, or maybe it's medical and then we have medicinal dispensaries so that right so then all of a sudden perceptions around availability change and those may impact in turn the perception of harm so this is i just want to kind of lay this out for you all um, right increase in uh, availability, decrease in social norms or the acceptance of use, if you want to think about it that way, and a decrease in the perception of these are all related in one way or another, but that isn't necessarily um, we, we, we need to be thinking about them, but we don't necessarily have to think them about them all together. I just wanted to lay out why we're focusing on these particular risk and protective factors. And that so would also explain the changes. Yep that have just recently taken place in uh, New York that were highlighted by Rupert Robbins. He said now they're beginning to open dispensaries. So that uh, that perception of harm and that uh, that norming process took place there. Absolutely. And and that's right. Like, and I think Vermont is another one who someone said earlier that retail availability is becoming um, is, is becoming available there. So, yeah, all of these. Right. Like there, there's a lot to be thinking about. Um, but let's let's start talking by talking a little bit about perception of harm, which is generally right uh, people's subjective judgments about the likelihood of a negative occurrence, such as an injury, an illness, a disease, um, or use happening. Be, right, like so, something bad happening because I take this action. Um, you know, we we chose this image because rock climbing. Our perception of harm might might actually for rock climbing might actually depend on our upper body strength. I don't have like this kind of upper body strength. So my perception of harm to this activity is pretty high, but if you have a, right? So just trying to make that link for us, that's why we call it the perception of harm. Um, there are a couple of research studies here that we looked at. Um, there was, um, you know, the article by Chatty when uh, Hassan, and I'm not gonna try to say the last one, um, it is a is an article from South America, um, but very but it had some really important and interesting kind of conclusions. So, what uh, Chadi Wen and Hassin found was that um, perception of harm may actually be most likely to be reduced. So that perception of harm may actually be going down when medicinal cannabis emerges. And right, like that actually makes sense because what are people, what what are we translating in our heads? Probably, oh, if that's a medication, that's medicine, that's probably safe. It's okay. Um, a doctor is, is you know, probably prescribing. I know there's a lot around, right, prescription drugs in general, but just to, you know, kind of make that link for us. Um, and, and so this, this article um, from, from South America actually looked at the perception of harm and looked at um, the frequency of use instead of like the initiation of use. And what they found was that once the perception of harm goes down, it's actually more likely that people will increase the number of times or the frequency that they use rather than necessarily just initiate their initial use. So that's something else to be keeping in mind. I know, you know, it used to be um, that we could look at the perception of harm for uh, a certain substance and we could figure out when we thought that, you know, that traditional 30 day use would start to go up. Um, but what we probably want to keep an eye on here is how often are young people using cannabis that might be even more important than that that initial question around initiation the other piece here is that um, there's actually also an article by stone which i think i forgot to cite to cite here um, but will not probably will not surprise many people here in that uh, um, a, if a person if a young person had a close friend who used they were more likely to use than um then depending on what their perception of harm was right so that 
close friend using was more tied to a youth's use than the, their perception of harm. Um, so that is that is something to be keeping in mind uh, when we're thinking about this kind of uh, data. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to social norms, right? Social norms, these are our unwritten rules of uh, beliefs, attitudes, behaviors that are considered acceptable in a particular social group or culture, right? I go to the grocery store. I don't go to the front of the line at the checkout. I go at the back of the line and wait my turn. That's a social norm that I'm not going to go kind of cut corners as much as I might want to. Um, but but when right so what are the social norms that drive um, that are present around substance use in our communities um, and there are a couple of of interesting articles here that I want to highlight Emil Chuck and Stanley in particular um, and Emil Chuck really find, found that males were more likely to be influenced by social norms than females I want to acknowledge this was a gender binary study. Um, we know that gender identities are more fluid than that, um, so that's a caveat to this particular article, uh, but I think it's worth highlighting because we often think that females are more likely to be influenced by things like peer pressure, but in this particular case, it was the males that were more likely to be influenced by those social norms. Um, Stanley actually looked at parental disapproval, and we'll um, we'll come back to this in a couple minutes, but um, parent in, in this particular case, you know, for thinking about parental disapproval as an indicator of, of a social norm, um, that the parental disapproval could still be more indicative of uh, potential use than, um, it, you know, than, than, than if the parental, if, if parental figures appro approved of use or didn't do that. Um, what is really interesting here is that that parental disapproval uh, was especially strong um, as a social norm where there was a strong female uh, culture. And in those cases, uh, that, that parental disapproval could actually overpower classmate norms and reduce that likelihood of use. So again, in this particular case, we have to also think about what are, what's what's true of our community. And, and Stanley was looking at a, a strong female culture, right? Like a, a, a a strong kind of female lead, maybe as a as as a part of the household who expresses that she disapproves of youth, that could overpower right peer use, classmate use, um, and reduce a youth's likelihood of use. So so right, like this is this is important, and this is really where right, like and Derek and I have talked about this, understanding our own cultures of our communities, of our neighborhoods, of our states is really important to figure out kind of where we have opportunities to amplify, right, protective factors, but also think about where we might need to um, get a little bit more information or um, even think about, you know, how do we reduce other risk. The final study that I want to highlight here, um, I, I referenced earlier, it was by Ross, um, and it's called the ABCD study. Can't recall exactly what that stands for at this particular moment, but I'll make sure that it ends up in the references. Um, and this is a long-term study where Ross and his colleagues um, are, are following youth. And in this particular uh, part of the study, they were looking at uh, children who are age nine to 11, um, and particularly those who lived in adult use or medicinal states. And what they found was um, that the the youth were the youth who lived in adult use and medicinal states were slightly more likely to have heard of cannabis than those who didn't, and that they may actually benefit more from alcohol prevention because they were also more likely to live in a state with more permissible norms and more alcohol experimentation. This is where, again, I really want us to be thinking about, do we need to really be doing cannabis prevention or do we need to be doing substance misuse prevention more thoroughly? 
or, or more holistically, right? So again, Ross is saying that for those nine to 11 year olds who lived in states where medicinal um, or adult use, um, where they where that was present, they were more likely to have heard of cannabis, but those states are also more likely to have more permissible attitudes around alcohol. Again, just something to um, know, to think about, and to uh, just be keeping in mind in terms of where you can focus your energies. I want to move on to talk about availability and access here, I, and I'm not going to talk about social access today. Again, like each one of these uh, risk factors could be a, a multi-hour session all in their own, but um, want to highlight again availability and access as it relates to uh, medicinal and retail. Right, so here we're really talking about how easy or hard it is to take uh, possession of a substance, right? Availability and access generally talks about both commercial and social, but again, today we're just going to focus on that that commercial piece. Um, so, uh, and these articles are by Salas Wright and Hust, and Hust we we referenced earlier. So generally speaking, greater retail or commercial availability was positively associated with use amongst use. Um, but there are some mixed results here in that there was one study that actually as commercial or retail uh, availability became a, a thing, right? So as that became legal, um, they actually saw that the perceived ease of access went down and that's because right like the youth perceived that the illegal market was disappearing and they were not going to be able to get it on the let's call it a regulated market or the legal market um this I, you know, I, I hesitate to hang all of our hats on this particular research study, but it's just something to keep in mind as, as things are changing, right? It, it might not be that you necessarily want to uh, focus only on availability, but something to keep in mind. And, and um, there was also some work that was done in, um, in Colorado, I believe, where they found that as, um, you know, medicinal was available and retail became available, that the medicinal actually became harder to get because there was a bigger profit to be made on the retail. So, right, like this is, again, these things are, there's no easy answer. They're just things to pay attention to and to know and to understand and to be thinking about when you're thinking about what can we do in our communities. Um, a I'm couple- parallel of to that, uh, Gisella. Yeah. That happened in Arkansas with the methamphetamine. We had all these laws that were passed to restrict the purchase of the, the supplies that were used to make it. So we think and we did a great job. And what ended up happening was the other market opened up and it started coming from south of the border to fill that gap and that need. So we have to think of it, as you said, holistically. As one thing goes away, then it gets it gets filled by another. Someone else fills the gap. So <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so a couple other things here, right? Uh, this will not be surprising to those of you who, who have worked in underage drinking prevention, uh, but for young people who live near retail or dispensary and they saw advertising, again, talking about that advertising, they perceived easier access, right? Because it's there, it's present. Um, proximity to retailers and the exposure to advertising was possibly uh, positively associated uh, with the intention to use. Again, intention to use is slightly different than actual use, but but related certainly. Um, and then <laughs> something that I think is just worth kind of knowing is that the initial research seems to indicate that um, it is the mere presence of retail uh, access of cannabis that is the risk factor versus the number of outlets, 
right? We talk a lot about in, in underage drinking prevention, we talk a lot about um, outlet, alcohol outlet density and, and being careful about that and thinking, you know, not wanting to have too much availability through those commercial outlets. But here, the initial research seems to indicate that it's the mere presence of a retail dispensary in a community and not the number that's that's impactful. So again, if if you do live in a state where retail is just becoming available, this is where, right, like pay attention to that and be thinking and timing your your potential prevention interventions related to when a, when a retail may be coming or maybe this is why you want to kind of push back onto um, to, to retail becoming available in, in some places. It's just an important context for us to keep in mind. I do imagine over time that that might change, but I'm not a researcher. So I, you know, I just, I just like to play one in my in my private life. No, I'm kidding. I don't. But right, like just important to to be thinking about. And I think right, part of the reason that I'm picking out some of these research studies, um, and we we did do a whole study, right? Like I'm not just like cherry picking things, um, but but because. Because we need, we in prevention need to be a part of this conversation, and we'll we'll get into that a little, little bit more. But that's really why I'm trying to highlight some of these things that we may not initially think about um, in our prevention efforts. So finally, want to finish up uh, this particular section talking about the parental disapproval of cannabis use, um, and I want to just acknowledge here, you know, different communities, different populations have different values around cannabis or some, you know, related substance. Um, and so uh, that is important to acknowledge, as is the fact that for some populations, doing things like parental monitoring can be really hard because how do you monitor when you have to work three jobs in order to keep food on the table? So I'm, I'm going to share some information and I'm I, I do that with a caveat of like, this is why it's really important that you as community people are the ones who know your communities and who know whether or not something might be relevant here. Um, and so I would just really encourage you, right, to, 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 to like acknowledge that on your own. And, and I don't know your community. I'm just telling you kind of what's coming in here. Um, and I do wanna come back to Rupert's comment because I think it's really, really important. So talking about parental disapproval of cannabis use. Um, so talked about, right? Like in the, the social norm slide about uh, parental disapproval, being able to mediate or mitigate classroom or peer use. Um, the counter, the counter is also true, right? Like parental permissiveness um, is also linked to earlier initiation. So parents and their uh, their 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 uh, opinions matter to our young people uh, as much as we sometimes think it doesn't. It actually does, especially you know those those younger ones. Um, so that's important and um, and just something to write like and it's it's you got you got to voice your disapproval if you disapprove. Um, as with other substances, parental disapproval, attachment communication with young people are protective against youth use. Um, what I think is really interesting is that there's also research about parental monitoring. So this one, I'm going to walk through this one and then we can come back and talk about it a little bit more, but parental monitoring of a young person's whereabouts. So knowing where a young person is um, and expressing strong disapproval of cannabis use can be protective against youth use even when the parent used in the past. And right, like, I think this is so important because we so often talk to parents who are like, well, I used when I was younger. And first of all, like, what was the THC level in that use? But like, okay, let's leave that conversation off to the side. But parents feel like hypocrites if they then say, well, I used when I was younger. Um, so I don't feel like I can say, hey, don't use. But this particular study is saying, no, actually, 
you monitoring the whereabouts of your child Mm -hmm. and you telling them that you disapprove of their use can still be protective against use. And they won't necessarily, the children will not necessarily see that as um, being hypocritical. The one thing to note here is that, um, you know, parental monitoring of like school activities is not enough to mitigate that 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 piece, um, but it's really kind of knowing wider what what a young person is doing. So I think that that's really really helpful and important to know, and something that we can work with when we're working with parents. Excellent. Those are some excellent suggestions. I want to uh, just pause for a second uh, so we can do a poll because you you've given them quite a few answers, but I want to see. Uh, if we can get a little bit of feedback and uh, if we could do, please pull up the, the poll now. Richard, thank you. Just take a moment to answer the question of the these factors, which do you know how to access or which do you have data on? So what do you know about your, your state and your data and that where you would be able to get, you know, a baseline of, of where these where these are and what you could actually change? If you could just answer in the poll now. all about having a foundation. You need to know where you are to decide where you're going, and which one is actually what you'll have an effect on and be able to change. Yes, Marcella, you have really laid out these to us. We want to see which one they have access to data for within their states right now. Okay, about 60% of you have answered uh, already, if there, there's no one else who would like to to choose, then we're going to go ahead and close the poll. Five, four, three, two, one. Interesting. Uh, are you seeing these as well, uh, Gisela? The, I the am. Time? Yeah. So really close too, right? Yes. So, um. <laughs> Yeah, there's not right availability of access. And that's right. We talked about commercials. So you're probably able to have a sense of kind of where where uh, where those uh, dispensaries or those retail uh, opportunities might be. Um, I am noting that a few folks are saying uh, that they don't necessarily have a lot of data um, or they have data on all of them. Um, some folks are saying I need to do some more research. That's what I like to hear. Like, it's okay if we don't have the answers, but finding, finding a little bit more on that, um, is, is important. So appreciate, appreciate all of that. Thank you all. Um, and I'm actually, I, I know there were a couple other questions and I wonder if we should go back to those before we, we keep going. Oh, absolutely. Um, and so I want to I want to highlight um, I think it was Rupert's question about um, right alcohol retail density has been found to be highest in poor neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color. Can we expect this with cannabis? Perhaps um, I don't. I'm gonna say that I don't know all of the research, but I will speak from my experience here in Massachusetts, where we had retail starting. I think like 2018, 2019, time flies. And with the pandemic, I just don't know what year it is anymore. Um, but what we found, and there were some, there were some pieces of regulation around this. So I just, right, like it's it's a little bit more complicated than I'm gonna paint the picture to be, but I think this this is still reflective. What we found quite honestly was that some of our white suburban communities were able to organize and keep retail establishments from opening in their communities. Hmm. Um, So, right, like to Rupert's point, I think this is something we really need to pay attention to and where we really need to be thinking about what are some of the um, retail regulations, the density questions that we need to ask. And I think, right, we're starting to see more energy around um, the, the kind of, uh, a a social justice component of the retail, but I think that 
we also have a responsibility to remind those white communities that are maybe a little bit more affluent that like, yeah, well, but there's still use happening in your community and where are folks going for that? Um, so I, I, I highly encourage us to continue talking about that, Rupert, and to um, make sure that we are, um, we are not letting that happen again. I don't know, Derek, if there's anything you would add to that from, from your experience. I think you've hit on all the points on there. I mean, it's, it's the more you know your community, the more people are able to, to make those assessments and make those changes. And the fact that they have a lot of access to the data already uh, actually cl clearly uh, positions them to be able to make some, some decisions and uh, be able to make some transitions in the near future. Yep. Um, saw some comments about parents and use. <laughs> Um, want to acknowledge, right? This is why we talk about youth use. I, you know, I, I hear a lot of people saying, well, vaping is more healthy. Well, we know that vaping can actually also cause lung disease that happened, right? There was a whole, whole bunch of uh, news media around that a few years ago. So it's not necessarily safer. The secondhand component of that may be different. I don't, I don't know the history of that or the, the research behind that. Um, but it is definitely, um, I think to Alana's point, thinking about um, how can we change some norms is really important here. Um, and we'll come back to, to policies in a little bit. So I don't wanna, um, I don't wanna necessarily kind of go too far down that, that rabbit hole right this moment. Um, I'm with you. I think, I think I think we'll, we can go ahead and move on. Excellent. Um, so we think, right, like why, why prevention? What do, what do we bring to this? And I think what's really important about the work that we do is we come from, um, right, a public health perspective. Um, my, one of my colleagues who, who some of you may, may know, uh, Deborah Gardner-Morris talks about, you know, our, our work is to, um, to address the public's health, right? So that's, it's, it's not just about the individual, it's about the, the, the public uh, as a whole. Um, and so with that, uh, you know, we're thinking about how do we work also with communities and how do we, um, and what, what, who are we collaborating with and which sectors and how are we doing that? So Lori just put a, a, a question in the chat that we'd be, we'd be curious to hear from you all on. Um, knowing kind of the, the risk and protective factors that we just went through, um, specifically around youth cannabis use, who are some of the individuals or organizations that you may have thought about collaborating with or continue to think about collaborating with or are collaborating with? Um, and it's okay if you don't have an answer to that specific question, um, but uh, I'm seeing county parks and rec, poison control, right? Poison control can help with that data. And also poison control, and, that, and this is where you have to understand what some of their data is, um, but some of the things that, that, you know, we, and just to add context to that, um, in, in some places, poison control has seen an increase in calls related to cannabis poisoning amongst youth. Um, and in some places, the cannabis that the youth have had access to is an edible, right? Like, so a chocolate bar that was not, did not belong to somebody in their family. Really important because then you're not necessarily targeting parents for a potential intervention in that part or a strategy in that particular space. You have to think about how do you make sure that you're getting a wider message out there about, you know, um, maybe it's locking up your cannabis or, or something like that. But again, right, like one at one, we need to know more information about that. Um, so, uh, seeing lots of other answers around schools, enforcement, social media, um, childcare, cannabis retailers. 
I like that idea a lot, right? We know that that worked with uh, preventing underage drinking. So I know we're running a little behind, so I'm going to keep going here. Um, and, and and right, like what I part of what I wanted to set us up for is if we're thinking about preventing youth cannabis use, you all have identified so many different organizations that land across this socioecological model that identifies the influences on use. Now, I'll acknowledge that this or this was originally developed around um, alcohol policy, but we adapted it a little bit for for cannabis use and looked at right like different kind of um, uh, influences or impacts on use, uh, depending on kind of where we're intervening. And really the thing that I want to emphasize here is that, you know, the, the, the individual level, um, issues, so race, ethnicity, immigration status, SES, those kinds of, 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 of characteristics are, are something we want to keep in mind. We want to understand how those populations are using and why. The why question is really, really important at the individual level because if we don't understand why, we're not going to be able to come up with a with a good strategy. But when we're thinking about the microsystem or the relationship level, how are we thinking about strategies related to family, home environment, schools? The community level, again, those like, right, we were talking about availability. What's available? How is it available? Um, what are some of those norms that we need to be thinking about? And then that advertising and marketing and the general policy around cannabis use, these pieces are all important. And together, they are what can work together to, to address youth cannabis use. So what are some of these things that we may see uh, or, or, or lessons that we may have learned um, in some of our other uh, substance misuse prevention efforts? And I really, right, like this is, this is for those of us who have addressed underage uh, drinking uh, prevention, right? Like I've already referenced that a number of times because I think that that's really relevant here. So. Um, to start with, we need to understand those who don't believe in youth cannabis prevention. Why is that? And how do we find out what they, uh, why that is or, or how they see that rolling out? We don't need to be antagonistic about that. We genuinely need to understand where they're coming from. We need to be thinking about how do we include um, what we might refer to as untraditional partners. We included vendors here, but in some places that's not as um, that's not as untraditional. Um, but really thinking strategically about who needs to be a part of this work. How do we mobilize and uh, community support and and generally build uh, capacity for action? And how do we be strategic? and stay focused on that long-term goal, regardless of which, you know, what the current state of adult personal use is in our, in our current, uh, in the current place that we live, we have to keep in mind, right, that long-term vision of where we're trying to go. We certainly need, right, a couple of short-term wins, but our, we're, we have to keep the long-term in mind, and um, we we should be remembering that, right? Like it becomes really important in building relationships with new partners. That's a that's a long time process. It's not something like I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and have coffee with Derek tomorrow and we're gonna be best friends. I mean, we might be, but I, I shouldn't assume that that's going to be the the case. Um, so just keeping, you know, just want to want to acknowledge that we know a lot from all of the work that we have done in prevention, uh, and we want to think about how can we apply that here. So um, we want to have a, another quick conversation. I'm going to invite Derek in. I know we're running a little late, so maybe we can, we can do this a little more quickly than we had initially said. Um, but um, what do we know about cannabis use in our communities already? I know some of you said you don't have a lot of data. Uh, some of you do. Um, but what kind of what, what do folks already know? Sorry, Derek, I think I cut you off. I'm not going to be your bestie if I keep doing that. Oh, we are totally fine. I, I, I'm just looking for the chats now so that we can uh, get some shares in there because that's truly 
as you said, one of the, the factors that is going to make the, the most significant difference is knowing the community. Uh, so um, glad we asked this question. Uh, what do you know about cannabis use in our communities? Okay, Ms. Bra Tina Bradley says we have data to show it is the most used illicit drug among youth. Uh, Chuk says there's a perception of harm that is decreasing. And we talked about that earlier. Excellent point. Uh, youth use went down during the pandemic. Uh, here in Arkansas, again, people are uneducated. Uh, there's more to that statement. Hold on. Uh, on the current laws regarding cannabis. So there needs to be more of a campaign to let people understand it. And then Jeannie Adams says we have the Youth Risk and Resiliency Survey and Community Survey for Use Rates. Excellent data to, to be able to pull upon. Uh, says students report use as a way to cope with stress. Interesting. Without understanding that the symptoms they are trying to self-medicate with are signs of CBD withdrawal. Comments continue to come in. Uh, we have data to show that the perception of harm uh, among youth is lowest of, of all youth substances. And this seems to be a recurring theme now. Uh, as we discussed earlier, with uh, medical uh, use becoming more prevalent, there's a perception of harm that's decreasing. So I, I appreciate kind of all these this reflection, right? Because I, I think there, there are certain themes that we can pick out of this. Um, and we can see that there are, as, as much as there are differences in our communities, I think we can also see that there are some similarities. So we really encourage you to think about um, how, um, how you can see what other folks are doing and use it to uh, improve and supplement what, whatever gaps you may have. Uh, in, in thinking about prevention in, in the work that you're doing. Um, Here's an interesting one. I had a, uh, where it says, I had to talk with the deaf and hard of hearing high school students. And they are often confused about legalization and illegal of uh, cannabis use across states. Uh, while federal illegal, while uh, some states are legal. And that, that, that question uh, bears uh, attention because uh, we have to make sure that there are universal messages that are getting out to not only the, the, the youth in our regular schools, but also in our, our uh, schools where there are special needs that are occurring as well. Well, and it, it speaks to something larger, right? Like it is very, it is incredibly confusing that at the the federal level, uh, cannabis is still a schedule one drug, I, I want to say. Um, now, that's partially because we're signed on to a United Nations treaty that says that we'll keep it there, but we see laws changing in, in other countries. Um, but we also see that, right, like some of those laws are being disproportionately um, enforced with some populations versus others, and that's important to acknowledge. Uh, but especially for, right, like people who cross over state lines there's lots of, right, like there, there, there's lots of confusion. If I drive from Pennsylvania to Massachusetts, like before adult use was legal in, in Connecticut, I could drive across three state, three different states, but I would see a billboard for cannabis availability in Massachusetts, like all the way in New York, right? Like so far away. Like this is part of what the cannabis industry, quite honestly, is good at. Is it is, it is a it is an industry that knows how to um, quote unquote sell itself, which is important to acknowledge. I cannot personally imagine how much more confusing that would be um, if I was in a place where right, like I didn't have um, the opportunity to have conversations about all of these nuances with people who understood them. So um, I just want to say, Misty, thank you for sharing that. I think you're highlighting especially that there are inequities when we talk about people um, with disabilities and how these things are often much more confusing and much harder for them. So I, I appreciate that comment. 
I want to thank everyone for sharing so we can understand more, more about your communities. I think the goal at this point is for us to really sit back and think about everything based on, on what we've discussed. And, and I'll, you'll get a chance to answer later, but I want you to be thinking about how do we move forward knowing what we know, knowing what we've learned, and what are some of the gaps we know we have. You don't have to answer that now, but I want you to think about that for later on when we talk about, uh, give you an opportunity to respond and provide uh, some questions or some at the end. All right, I will take that as a cue to keep going. Um, so kind of talked about this already, um, but I really want to emphasize here this last piece on this slide, nothing about us without us, right? Like that is what we know we have to abide by if we want to be successful in our prevention efforts. So, right, Misty, thank you for highlighting again that working with the deaf and hard of hearing, if we want to design prevention efforts that are a, that that will work with that population then they have to be a part of our conversation if we want to be thinking about how do we work with populations that have been disproportionately impacted by uh, the criminalization of cannabis then they need to be a part of our everyday conversation and not just an add-on they need to be right like fundamentally a part of 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 the fabric of our communities that that that's working towards these efforts um and again i keep talking about cultural context that's so 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 important here um and um and i, I will leave it at that and keep going um so derek i think that i'm gonna hand this one over to you again well thank you so much um uh... I want to uh, pose a chat question at this time for everyone, so you get a chance to, to let me know what you're thinking. But looking at the list of words that you see here, this, and I, this is a word cloud, of course, uh, which topics are most strongly linked to collaboration in your community? Looking at this list of words in the cloud, which topics are most strongly linked to collaboration in your community? And uh, we all know a collaboration that enables individuals to work together to achieve a defined and common purpose. It leads to more innovation, and efficient processes, and it improves systems. It increases success, and it improves communication. What do you see here that stands out to you that's most strongly linked to collaboration in your community? I see public health. I see normalization. Normalize Normalization. Oh, well, I need a sip of water myself. <laughs> coalitions of messaging, uh, public health and coalitions, social marketing, and working with dispensaries. Interesting. Uh, coalitions is a reoccurring theme. Public health is a reoccurring theme. In that messaging. So we have a lot of things that are standing out in. Uh, as being commonplace throughout the, the states that we have here. I see lots of opportunities here, right, to be thinking about how can we be doing this work differently, um, and also lots of challenges, potential challenges, uh, as it relates to all of that. So uh, shall we move on to some strategies so we can think about how we can engage some of these folks? Uh, I think so. I just want everyone to remember that everybody comes together and works as one uh, when it talks about co collaboration. Nothing without, nothing for us without us. And the workflows becomes, it becomes smoother and tasks can be achieved quicker and effectively. Those healthy relationships can be formed and productivity can be improved. So without a doubt, this in turn, it, it can boost morale, uh, encapsulates and motivates at all different levels. There's so many benefits to collaboration and for people working together. So um, I kept seeing coalition come up over and over again. And that, that is a, a strong theme when it comes to coalition. So uh, just remember as you as you look at this, highly effective collaborations are, are transparent. I wanna make that clear uh, to understand that they're transparent. And, and, you have to listen to understand and then not to reply. So uh, that's uh, that's my one to grow on when it comes to the word cloud. Thank you for participating in this exercise. 
Thanks so much, Derek. And I, you know, want to highlight a couple things that that popped up in the chat while you were talking. Um, Rupert talks about reclaiming marginalized lives, um, and that's really right. Like to your point about um, collaboration, that's that's an important part of that, and and that cultural humility that comes that comes right for someone such as myself who might be wanting to do this work. Um, I have to I have to have a really good ear. Um, and Lisa's comment around many hands making light work. Um, yes. it, it can be more complicated in the in the short term as you try to figure out how to make decisions. But in the long run, again, keeping that long term in mind, it can be really, really helpful. Um, so and and Sean acknowledging right working with dispensaries can be challenging. So like maybe we can come back to these in a little bit if we if we have some time. Um, cause they, it sounds like we might have some opportunities for, for folks to share a little bit more about how they are working with, uh, dispensaries already. So, um, we're gonna, like I mentioned earlier, we are going to talk about two specific strategies, uh, related to, um, preventing youth cannabis use. And in the interest of time, we were going to do a quick poll, but I think, I think let's leave that one um, and we'll come back to it later if we have time, because uh, I do want to talk about these strategies a bit. Um, so the two strategies are policy and communication. Um, and I want to spend a little bit of time talking about both of them. Um, and we don't have a lot of extra slides on this, so just kind of keep that, keep that in mind. Um, but when we're thinking about policy, I encourage you not just to be thinking about policies around retail establishments and, and where they might be able to be and how you might make sure that those uh, retail owners are also, right, like a part of the fabric of your community, um, but also thinking about uh, school and community use policies. And here I actually want to go back to Rupert's point um, around, you know, marginalized communities, under-resourced communities, um, populations uh, with lower socioeconomic status, but also Black, uh, Latinx, Indigenous populations that may not have the same resources as the rest of us. Um, and think, be cognizant of how the policies that we're designing may impact them. And I'm gonna give you one, one quick example, right? So um, if, if we have adult personal use uh, policies that say that we are not allowed to use cannabis on public right land, so that might be, you know, someone mentioned playgrounds earlier, um, right? But they, it can't be out, kind of in public that we can only use in our own private spaces, um, but you live in a place like public housing. What does that mean for somebody who's living in public housing, who is an adult who's allowed to use and technically is not allowed to use inside, not allowed to use outside? I'm not gonna pretend to have the answer to what policy should be designed to right, like create a good public health space around that. But I think what, what I want us to be thinking about is what are the unintended consequences of some of the policies that we may be enacting, right? I mentioned the, um, the, the retail bans in some of the uh, more white suburban communities um, not too far outside of the city of Boston. And right, like what unintended consequences did those have is that drove more traffic into or, or, or purchasing into another community. Um, and, and right, like in this idea that like, well, people don't use in our communities. Well, that's also not quite true. So I just really want us to be thinking about what what the how we're thinking about these policies, who's going to be enforcing them and how those will be enforced and how those will impact our populations. Um, in terms of school policies, you know, um, a community I worked in uh, years ago, instead of um, 
a zero tolerance policy went for zero indifference. And so in this particular case, right, we are not going to ignore the fact that somebody may, may some young pe person maybe um, came to school high or may maybe was using in the bathroom, um, but we're not going to be indifferent to it. We're not necessarily going to be punitive about it, but we're going to try to take a little bit more of a holistic perspective. So um, I, and, and policy change is hard, right? Like it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. Uh, but I really, I, I really think that especially as more medicinal cannabis uh, laws become, come into place in our in our states uh, that more recreational or, or adult use, see it did it again, words, they matter, and I still don't always get them right. Adult personal use cannabis uh, is available. Like these things are, um, we, we have to be thinking about uh, how all of these things will impact people differently. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll kind of leave it at that uh, and remind us everything I talked about earlier around advertising. We do want to be really careful about where we're advertising, thinking about the lessons we learned um, from other substances, thinking about right like what that means for um, placement of ads, what can be in ads. I, I noticed someone earlier was talking about packaging, um, and there there are policies. I think it's you know I would I would look at what Colorado and Oregon and Washington State have done around uh, uh, laws and policies regarding packaging and what can uh, what can packaging look like? What can it not? Right? Like it can't look attractive to young people. Well, what does that mean when you? It's just a chocolate bar, right? Like that. That is right. Like there's lots to think about here. Um, but I also want to talk about communication. Um, and in this particular case, communication strategies that are focused on behavior change. So we really want us to think about not just um, kind of one way information dissemination, but um, more intentional, strategic, longer term communication messages that are focused on behavior change. So um, in this particular case, you know, I think when we really, really want to do social marketing campaigns effectively, we have to do our own little like strategic prevention planning model for that particular strategy. We have to understand what the need is. We have to, you know, draft messages. We have to, you know, test those messages. We have to revise them. Then we have to think about images. We have to test that. We have to get intercept surveys. We have to like place it, right? Like all of these things are um, really important components of an effective social marketing campaign. Um, and actually looking at really focusing our messages on particular populations. Right? I mentioned the individual um, and the socio-ecological model earlier, and that understanding the why folks are using, if we want to change their behavior, if they're already using, we have to do better than just don't use. Um, and in this particular case, I would really encourage folks to take a look at some of the work that um, the rescue agency has done. Um, they're a behavior change agency, and they look at not just demographics, um, but they look at audience segmentation in terms of looking at lifestyles, at behaviors, at values, to really try to craft messaging that will address the who, why, how, when of use in, in very different ways. Um, they have a couple of research articles out. They have a few resources on their website. They are a little proprietary, but I think, right, like if we can think about how to design messages that really speak to um, people around the behaviors that we want them to change and give them valid um, and doable alternatives, that becomes really important. So um, the rescue agency is, is definitely a group that, that I would encourage folks to uh, take a look at if you're thinking about communication. And again, right, like communication, focused on two-way communication. Um, maybe you're using social media as a channel to get your message out, but generally speaking, we want to also make sure that 
we're not just reaching people in one with one particular um, channel. We want to be thinking about, um, you know, can we get them online? Can we get them in person? Can we get them on the phone? Can we write like lots of different ways? Um, I was talking about the rescue agency to the to Kathy to to your question. Um, yes, we can we can get a, a link to the website. Thanks. I think Derek's already working on it. Thanks so much. Um, so I right like these are two strategies that are focused both on kind of like you know the whole community, but we can also be thinking very strategically about how do we make sure that we're um, focusing in and and working with um, developing these in collaboration with the people who will be most impacted. Again, policy, nothing about us without us, communication, nothing about us without us, making sure that we are engaging the populations that we're trying to, to affect as well as we can uh, and collaborate with them to our earlier conversation. This is everything that I just said uh, in one quick slide, what works in prevention, engaging specific populations, communicating effectively and creating intentional communication campaigns um, and policies that help address youth access and advertising. So Derek, I think I'm pausing now and inviting you back in. Well, thank you so much. I wanna start with a chat and uh, to begin our conversation here. Knowing your community or your state, what strategies do you think would work in your community or state? And a lot of you, you answered some of these at the very beginning because we asked you uh, what, what were some of the things that worked already in your state uh, when it came to uh, preventing youth cannabis use. And Misty started, uh, had a reaction there at captioning for me because there's no, oh, sorry about that. Uh, in, uh, peer influence, uh, there was evidence-based programming that was answered. Todd said evidence-based programming, uh, chastity, Smith uh, posted education and open conversation. So uh, after you've participated in our in, in, in this conversation today, what do you think now your answer is in your community and state? What strategy do you think that would work in your community now? Because you've learned a few more techniques and strategies. Okay, changing policy for the packaging, social marketing and campaigns. Uh, okay. Uh, the SPIF, I love the SPIF. Partner engagement, okay, the answers are rolling in. And these strategies are, you know, those primary prevention uh, they include like population-wide strategies or targeted. It can be uh, high-risk strategies that focus on populations or subgroups, but um, I wanna see some, are there any communities where family-centered interventions could, could, could take place? Could be utilized also because those are designed to deter cannabis use among uh among youth as well focus on skills on resiliency building versus okay messaging and focus on why peer-to-peer -peer mentoring oh that has worked very well see quite a few coming in i've seen prevention dissemination yet uh, where any stra prevention strategies can be used or put in place before the behavior actually occurs to prevent it from occurring at all. Uh, teen interventions, okay. You started life skills training, excellent. And third, three to eighth graders. These are wonderful. You know, Derek, one of the things I love about some of these programs too, right? Like it's it's what we talked about earlier. It's not just cannabis focused, it's prevention because all, right? All substance use prevention is youth cannabis prevention. Right. And some of these work, some of these strategies work better for some um, some populations and in some schools and some school districts than in others. So um, I think we, you know, it's it it's it's just kind of that piece again of understanding what what does work, um, and 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 what some of the norms in our communities are that that will you know kind of allow some of these things to go in. Excellent point. 
oftentimes you have to be be mindful of that. You know, as you replicate these different uh, interventions, and uh, there may be a change in in efficacy. Uh, that was actually the original efficacy that validated the program because you have that uh, decline effect that takes place as you start to replicate things over and over in different places, uh, mostly because of uh, the audience may not be exactly the same, but overall, that's why it's important with evidence-based interventions to adhere to, to, the, to the protocol as closely as possible. Make sure they fit the population. When your community again becomes extremely important. Yes, yeah. Okay, basics is one of our main strategies. I see so many strategies that are coming up. Thank you, Rupert. I know Deanna asked about, has anyone had success with social norming peer leadership groups? And it looks like a few folks. So Melissa has, um, and um, someone else is using CRM to increase coping skills. Um, and it's interesting, right? Like, because there's, I'm thinking one of the things that it made me think of, and I don't think I, we included the, the, um, the information around this particular article, but some of us may remember the Above the Influence campaign, which is really right. Like it's about um, kind of youth leadership ideas. Um, some of the research behind that actually showed that what, what Above the Influence was really good at was enhancing existing protective factors. Um, so that's, that's really important to know, right? Cause if, if someone has a protective factor in a, in a school that, that can help to, right? Like boost that. Um, but it's also important to know because it might mean that it's not going to reach some of the students that don't have those protective factors. And so what does that mean for kind of what else can you do there? Um, but that's where we might have, right? Adult role models and thinking about something like, a, and I'm going to way go out in left field for a second, but a social development strategy where we're thinking about how can adults be positive role models for, for young people in our communities um, to kind of help build up some of those protective factors. So important. Just want to remind you, like, as the landscape is changing, just remember that you, it, the, the time to start is not after, the time to start is before. You can can start setting up the changes in the environment in, in advance of the behavior starting to occur, uh, which means like we, we don't have to wait for um, recreational marijuana, recreational uh, cannabis to become uh, legal uh, to reduce the chance that it's going to affect our community. We have to start start early and changing the environment beforehand, so it's it's not conducive to it. I've seen coalitions do quite a bit of work. Uh, personally in here in uh, Arkansas, uh, where some community youth have uh, been a part of coalitions and actually had laws passed within uh, their communities where uh, the distribution center dispensaries couldn't even legally be set up in that in that place. So you can do something ahead of time. Okay. Thank you all for sharing. Great. I love the focus on community resilience. Um, so, so thank you all for sharing that. Um, we are getting closer to, to wrapping up, so I'll, I'll go through a few more slides quickly. Want to highlight um, this particular resource for you all. This is um, something that SAMHSA put out last year. Um, it has more details on. Uh, more risk and protective factors. It has um, more information on more types of strategies and those kinds of things. Again, we um, were really looking for today, like how can we make sure that um, we kind of weave a story that's that's all linked versus trying to go too far afield. So encourage folks to look at this and and thank you so much, Lori, for, for putting that link in the chat. Again, this is a, um, a SAMHSA document, so uh, free of charge if you just click on that link. Um, and then uh, the PTTC uh, system also has a, a cannabis prevention work group. Um, and in the, their website, so in their priority area uh, website, they have lots of resources. Um, I actually did a two 
part webinar series for them. One risk and protective factors, one in strategies, you kind of got both in one. So if you want more details on those, encourage you to go look there. But they also have resources coming from um, that are that are that were developed by the um, American Indian and Alaska Native PTTC by the um, Hispanic and Latino PTTC. So write some some resources on specific populations that I encourage you to look at. And everything kind of in this website gets updated, um, you know, as soon as new things come out. So encourage you to also kind of bookmark that and, and revisit it frequently. And Lori put that link in the chat box for you. Um, and then I think we're we're pausing for questions if folks have them. Um, I think we still have a couple minutes. Sorry, my clock's over there now. <laughs> yes, we're pausing for questions. Also, I would like if, in the chat if you could put any your one takeaway from today or one action step that you plan to take after participating in this service today in the chat. The one takeaway or what act, one action step that you plan to take. Thank you, Frank. Uh, seek help from community leaders. Excellent. That collaboration, policy and communication are the key strategies. That is a great takeaway. Okay, aha, coalition is on, on the right track. I love to hear that. Fighting local retailers, okay, bring them to the table. Yes, nothing for us without us. There are a lot of uh, comments out here. Gisela, thank you and great information. Thanks Lots for having me. Thank you that are going to you. Cool. We continue to share. I want to move on to our next slide because it's not over until the paperwork is done. Uh, we appreciate the comments. Uh, thank you, but we really need you to complete our survey. If you have a smartphone, you can put it up to the screen and scan the QR code. If not, there's a link there. Uh, we'll also uh, add the link into the chat. And when you sign out, you'll get an opportunity to, if you can't click on the link or use the QR code, it'll take you directly to the survey. But so whatever shape or form you need to, we need each and every one of you to complete our, our survey because that lets us know how we did. And it also gives us direction and how we can continue to fulfill uh, your needs in the future. Uh, special thanks. Uh, to Gisela Rotz for being with us today. Sincerely appreciate you sharing your, your ideas and um, your, your vast knowledge with us to help guide us on this path. It's, it's, we are in, on the cusp of a lot of change that's uh, taking place in our, in our communities. And as, as just as, as unique as our community is, there are other states and other communities all across the, our country who are dealing with these same challenges. And the fact that we were all able to gather here today is a sign because we were able to look and see that each and every one of us have unique challenges, but also how we could be working together in order to improve our communica communications and our communities. Seeing the, the successes early on that, that people have had uh, should give you some ideas of things that you can possibly do. Uh, but I want each and every one of you, especially to remember that we're all in this together. And we will share this uh, slide deck with you uh, so that each and every one of you will have the opportunity to look upon this again. And if you have any additional questions for, for us uh, on our next slide, we have our contact information. You can contact me directly at the PTTC and we'll uh, provide you additional uh, assistance. We do provide technical assistance as well. If you have challenges that are unique to your community or your state, and uh, we'll do our best to meet those needs as well. So feel free to contact us for that technical assistance to help you to move forward in these 
uh, trying and engaging times so that you can be successful. And that's what we are. That's the reason why we're here is we're a resource to you. Uh, we have the, the South Southwest PTTC website, which you can go to. You can join our mailing list. And then we have a vast amount of products and resources that are available for you at the, just a keystroke. So uh, we're here for you. Uh, we have additional slides here, our references. And when you get our slide deck, then you'll also have access to those references as well. So this concludes our time together.